going to cap off um, our series of messages entitled, I am what he says I am. Uh, we've been looking at some I am nots uh, because it is very critical to realize where we are um, in our walk with God and where we are in our personal life. You know, and there are moments where we have to take stock in what we have said about ourselves. There are times we have to really assess, you know, or, or really look at uh, where we are, uh, who's in our sphere of influence, the people that are in our lives. We got to look at where we are, both physical places and then just kind of in the timeline uh, that we believe God has for our life. We've got to look at the provisions, the tools, the opportunities, the things that God has put into our hand. There are moments when you've got to pause for the cause and you've got to take stock and look at where you are, because I can promise you where you are is never the end of your journey. Our life will ever be changing and moving and evolving until you take your very last breath. There will always be something new from God. There'll always be a stretching, you know, or a building up or a pulling into or a pulling out of that God does in our life. He's never finished. He will perfect those things which concerns us. He will bring us to a place of maturity. But God is always developing us on our deathbed. How many people have you heard on their deathbed? They give words of wisdom. Some a grandmother or a mama or a daddy gives words of wisdom to their child and their last moments breathing is giving that child a word that will carry that child, whether young or grown, into their next season of life. So God uses us to the very last minute. And you and I have to be, have to be in step with God because he wants to use us, right? He wants to move in you and through you at the same time. So we have been taking stock this last month on some I am nots. And we've been looking at um, how we've been set up We've been looking at sometimes how we get tricked into certain things. We've been looking at how we get set up, how we get tricked into certain things. We've been looking at some things we've allowed ourselves to become in the grand scheme of things. And, and we last week we looked at the excuses, you know, that we often make and all of these things hinder. You know, and sometimes, unfortunately, really stop what God wants to do, you know, in our life. But tonight, I just kind of feel led to 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 end it on this this theme. I am not a sabotage. I am not I am not a sabotage. It's almost as if all of these things kind of lead to the pinnacle. You know, are you going to step into what God has for you or are you going to find a way to sabotage or destroy and live a life that is lower or less than what God has for you? It's kind of where excuses, you know, move us into. See, when it comes to the call of God that is on your life, you, you've been amazed really at how many people make excuses. But more than more than that, how many people sabotage? Uh, what God wants to do, sabotage the life that they could have. See, what we fail to realize is this, that there's a trend. You know, our our excuses are often the hidden verbalizer. We say that real quickly. That's kind of weird. Our excuses are often the hidden verbalizer of sabotage in the making. It, it's almost as if I can see it coming. It's almost as if, you know, you're telling me before you actually do what you're getting ready to do. So if I learn to listen very closely at myself and people around me, I will discover sometimes that, you know what? I might be getting ready to sabotage everything that God wants to do. You pay attention to your words, pay attention to your movements, pay attention to your actions and just watch and see what your flesh tends to lead you into. And that's why tonight we want to end by fighting for your spirit, man, fighting for you on the inside, fighting for you to rise up from the inside out and become and declare and take a step forward into who God says that you are. You are what God says you are. Can you put that on the screen? I am what he says I am. 
You've got to make that declaration and move in that direction. I am not my sabotage. I am what God says I am. So, so where do you see this thing at? You see sabotages in a lot of different places, but let's give a few examples of how it, how it shows itself. Well, what about relationships? Relationships. You find yourself in a great relationship, uh, but you cheat on your partner because you're afraid of commitment. You, you find yourself breaking up with a good man or a good woman because you are afraid of getting hurt. Yeah. You break up because you don't feel worthy to be with the person that you are with. Sometimes people destroy relationships because they are afraid of vulnerability and exposure. So, so we sabotage the relationships that come into our lives. Well, what about on the job? A lot of us sabotage our jobs. We, we miss a work deadline because we are afraid of promotion. You say, Juan, how in the world does that make sense? Well, with promotion often becomes accountability. With promotion often becomes more stress. Yes, more money comes, but more issues come. So sometimes we find a way to sabotage or back ourselves out of being considered for the next level because we are afraid of what comes with promotion, right? We get drunk or we get lit, you know, before we have a gigantic presentation with a huge client and miss it because we don't feel worthy of being in the room. We don't feel worthy of, of, of a million dollar transaction. Sometimes we procrastinate on tasks that are work related in order to avoid anxiety and work related stress. Have you ever heard of the word self-efficacy? It's, it's an extreme and overwhelming sense of modesty because you have trouble believing your own ability. So you talk yourself down and shoot yourself down. We sabotage our personal goals, right? We, we procrastinate on producing something because we fear the possibility of disappointing others. So we sabotage with procrastination. Right. Sometimes perfectionism, we set an impossible standard, which ultimately causes a delay in our life because we are afraid of the accountability that comes with a new level of success. How many of us have ever sabotaged going to the gym one day what we miss one day? And then we decide to quit the whole process because at the end of the day, I really miss my candy bar. I really miss what I'm really craving. So I find a way to sabotage so I can say, oh, well, no, I was going to mess up. Let me just go ahead and eat what I really want to eat. Right. So we sabotage ourselves in our personal goals. Well, what are we really saying? We sabotage for a myriad of reasons, four main reasons for your success. Fear of change, fear of failure, fear of pressure. If I located you already, just hit me one time and say, that's me. Fear of success, fear of change, fear of failure and fear of pressure. And so what happens is we play it out in everyday life. And this is why you got to really pay attention to what your movement is, because we play it out by creating hurdles. We create hurdles, right? We create hurdles often in a form of some kind of avoidance, right? We avoid the issue by trying to create a hurdle that we cannot cross over. This is the mechanism. And if you watch your life carefully, I promise you, you sabotage something in your life. What about adding a new car loan when you're trying to buy the house that your spouse really wants? Out of fear of telling your spouse, I don't want the house, you go out and buy something that messes up your credit so that someone else can tell you, I can't, you cannot afford the house. Ah, that's me, Juan. That's me. Sabotage. Sabotage. I create some kind of hurdle that causes me to avoid what's really happening in my life. And so 
So I read an interesting article and it talked about these six things. It talked about six ways of sabotage, procrastination. I already talked about that. But one that I want to throw in is courting temptation. What does that mean? That means being around something that you already know is not good for you. I put myself around a particular food that I know I shouldn't eat. I get around a person who is my weakness that I should not be around because they know how to get my motor running. The older people would say <laughs> they know how to stir me up. Right. They know how to get me to turn up how the young people would say, right? And so I court or I play. The Bible says, what make a man think if he will play with fire that he will not get burned? But we like to play with fire, right? We court temptation and that helps us to sabotage. Reprioritization, right? I can't go to school this semester one because I, I need money, so I got to get a job, right? And so we reprioritize things in order to sabotage. How about self-medication? Has anybody on here ever self-medicated themselves? You take some kind of drugs or you misuse drugs in order to avoid the trauma of dealing with emotions or trauma-related emotions that they would call it in the mental health field, right? So what about defensiveness? How many of us have used defensiveness to, to sabotage the fact that we are emotionally weak? And the way that I can hide my weakness is to become excessively defensive. It's called living behind a mask. I push others away because I don't want them to know how weak that I am. So I bite other people's head off. I become judgmental. I become very critical. I, be, I become antisocial and I move away. I sabotage a relationship because it has the potential to show my weakness. Oh, it's good already. But what I've already what I found also is that we sabotage things in the kingdom. This is what I really want to get to tonight, because, you know, all of these other things. But we have a habit of sabotaging, sabotaging ourselves in the kingdom of God. How about our worship? I refuse to worship God properly for fear of being a hypocrite. Because the real deal is I really don't want to give up that thing or that person that I am attached to. Right. So I sabotage my worship. I pull away from my worship and, and I make the excuse that I'm a silent worshiper. I make the excuse that they're not playing my song. I make the excuse that, 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 that I don't really know the people in this ministry. And the real deal, if we really be honest, the real deal is sometimes I'm attached to something. And if I worship God the right way, that he's going to confront me with what I'm attached to. And so I don't want to give it up. So therefore, I'm not going to give the worship up. God, have mercy. Have mercy. Well, when it comes to building, building something or witnessing something, I'm afraid of speaking the word of God. So I refuse to speak the word of God to someone because I'm really afraid of rejection. So I will not witness the word. I won't share the gospel with someone. Not because not because they may not be receptive. That's the front. Right. But the real deal is I am personally afraid of rejection. So I'm going to sabotage this opportunity to share the word of God. How many of us uh, we sabotage when it comes to serving? Right. We sit instead of getting involved because we fear that God could never use me. I'm never worthy of God using me. So I'm going to sabotage what God wants to do by sitting and refusing. I'm going to find some kind of excuse. They meet on the wrong day. I'm going to find some kind of excuse, right? They, they, go, they, they have church too long or they meet at the wrong time of day. I find some kind of excuse to pull myself out because I don't believe in myself that God can really use me. What, what about when God has called you to build something, man of God? What about woman of God when he says, I want you to start this ministry or start this business that's going to be for my glory? We prolong it, right? We prolong launching what God has called us to because we really, at the end of the day, I'm afraid of success. I am uh, afraid of the accountability that comes with success. 
So not only does it happen in relationships, not only does it happen in jobs, but it happens in ministry as well. Some of us are afraid for people to call upon us. You were born to be a mentor. You were born to be a leader. You were born to be a minister, right? You were born to share the word of God with someone. You were born to be a light where God has planted you. But because you are afraid of the responsibility, you're afraid of the accountability to God and to people, you find some way to sabotage and you never launch what God has called you to launch. Can you put it on the screen? I am not a sabotage. I will launch it. I will step forward in it. I will become who God has called me to be. I will be accountable, one. I will be responsible in the face of success. I am determined to step into it. I refuse to sabotage. Now, now here's the thing. As I move into the text that I want to kind of unfold real quickly, I want you to understand this. God prepares for your success before he asks you to step into it. I don't know if you ever heard it say that way, said that way, but God prepares for your success before he asks you to step into the process of it. In other words, God gives you the power to win. When he told Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. He also says, I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. What that means is every provision that would come along with him prophesying, every provision that he needed that would help and assist him, God had already prepared it for him. Can I take you to Elijah when he was by the brook? Have you ever thought about the fact that God pre-prepared the ravens? The ravens were not a response to Elijah saying there would be no rain. No, God called him to prophesy that there would be no rain. God called him to go by the brook Cherub. And there God sent the pre-prepared provision in the mouth of the raven so that he could be fed in the midst of a family. Oh God, can somebody say he's feeding me? He's feeding me in the midst of my family. God prepares you for your success. He prepared David by teaching David how to be a king when David was a shepherd. Somebody say, that's me. I'm not in what God has for me, but if I look at my training season right now, if I look at my wilderness right now, I will see that God is doing something amazing in my life to prepare me for what he has for me. So you have to see your preparation and the wilderness season a bit differently in your life. And so in Exodus chapter 4, beginning at verse 17, we see what mounts up to a moment of sabotage in Moses' life. He is called by God. And we've spent four weeks talking really about how God has already set the stage for him. If he will but trust God all the way, he will get there. God tells him in Exodus 3, leading into 4, everything that's going to happen, every challenge that's going to happen for him. And he tells him how he's going to be successful. And he puts a rod in his hand and he works a miracle. And God literally tells him in verse 17, take this staff in your hand so that you can perform signs with it. God prepares him and shows him and gets him ready for Egypt in Midian. Do you hear what I just said? He prepares him for Egypt while he is yet in Midian, all right? So how does Moses' story lead me to a place now of sabotage? How, how does it happen? How does he walk me to that place, all right? Moses goes back to his father Jethro and he says, let me return to my own people in Egypt and see if they are still alive. Jethro says, okay, go and I wish you well. Here is a moment now, here's a moment of, of fear, of opposition, right? Which Moses almost sabotages the power of God in his life. But God, somebody say, but God. 
Here's God. God says to Moses while he's in Midian, because God knows that Moses is fearing this opposition. God says, now go back now for all of those who wanted to kill you are dead. This people of God is the loving hand of God getting Moses to a place where he does not let Moses sabotage the moment, right? You got to learn how to thank God that God will not let you sabotage the moment. God loves you so much that he knows your fears, right? And if you walk with God, God will confirm in you, in you, that everything I've said to you already is going to take place. How do I know? Because I'm God. So go ahead. Don't fear anymore because those that were against you, they are now dead. Somebody say it's dead. The thing I was scared about, Juan, I realized it's dead. The thing that I feared the most, I got to see it as dead. The opposition that's trying to come to me, I see it now as dead. And so God tells him, go back. They're dead. So the Bible says Moses takes his wife and his sons. He puts them on a donkey. And guess what he does? He starts back to Egypt. And now the Bible says he takes the staff of God in his hand. Look at the verbiage here that speaks to why you and I cannot let sabotage get us because God's power to overcome is in my hand. I told you God prepares you for success before he even calls you. So there is something in your life that God has given to you that can win over sabotage. There is something in your life, if you look at it the right way, you can win over sabotage. Look at what's in your hand, child of God. Look at what God has given to you and you will use that as your success. Is it your ability to write? Is it your ability to prophesy? Is it your ability to work business deals? What is it in you? Is it your ability to administrate? Is it your ability to lead? What is that thing that's in your hand that God has said, if you look at this, and don't look at what wanted to kill you, you will be successful. Oh, I love that. God. Exodus chapter four, verse 21. The Lord now says to Moses, now when you return to Egypt with my rod in your hand, see to it now, see to it that you perform before Pharaoh all of the wonders I have given you the power to do. This is a check for Moses to not let his lack of confidence in God sabotage the opportunity that God has given to him. What am I saying to you? God has created opportunities for you. And your confidence, like Paul says, should not be in yourself. Paul says, I put no confidence in myself. I put all of my confidence in God. I press toward the mark of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. So my confidence in him, in me. Yeah, can you put that on the screen? In him, in me. My confidence in him that lives in me will make this opportunity that he's putting in my lap come to pass. So God says, when you return, see to it, make sure, don't forget, do this absolutely, perform, Moses, perform, perform. Man of God, I'm speaking to you. When God opens it up to you, step into it, speak it, take a step forward, declare it, make the business deal, make the phone call, get the building, change the career, change your ministry, step into the relationship. When I put you in it, make sure that you perform in the power that I've given to you because this is your opportunity. Why? God says, I'm going to harden the heart of Pharaoh right? So that he will not let my people go. So what is God telling him? Moses, I'm going to turn the heat up. But when I turn the heat up, I need for you to understand that that is a sign that I'm about to work power through your life. So the heat is not to smush you. The heat is not to scorch you. The heat is to deal with your enemy. So I'm giving you the opportunity to be used by me, not to be crushed by me. Oh, help me. Somebody say, use me, God. Use me, God. So verse 22, it, it goes this way. Moses says, uh, then say to Pharaoh, God, then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord God says. Israel is my firstborn son. 
And I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me, but you refused to let him go. So I will kill your firstborn son. We've heard that for years. Have you ever stopped to think of what it really means? It's a prophecy. It is a warning that God is giving to Pharaoh through Moses that I'm going to do something to your firstborn son. See, it is a warning against the 10th plague early. So Pharaoh should have known because he would have heard the word of God. But the problem here is not Pharaoh. The problem that's getting ready to lead to the biggest sabotage is that Moses here has to have an understanding. What I want to suggest to you is the lack of understanding can sabotage God's protection over your life. You have to understand what God is saying. You have to go deep in what God is saying to someone else. Don't you ever think that the word of God is not a double-edged sword, that when God calls you to speak it to someone, that he's not also speaking something into your life as well. So if he's calling Pharaoh to a, to a, a walk of obedience, he's calling you to a walk of obedience. What God is telling you to tell someone else is not just so that you can check someone, not so that you can put them in their place, Oftentimes, it's hitting both ways. How do I know, preacher? Because I'm a preacher myself. There is nothing that I say to you that don't hit both ways. There's nothing that I tell you that has not already sliced my neck, cut me to the cut me to the core, and worked in my heart. And so, as I preach to you, the word of God is working in my soul at the same time, dividing the soul and the spirit asunder. That's what the Bible says. So Moses, hearing the the warning to Pharaoh is critical to what is happening in Moses' life now. What do you mean, Juan? God is getting ready to use Moses, but it is a high call. And everybody shouts about the high call, but the high call of God can be scary because it does require obedience. It does require change, right? And the three things that I want to leave to you tonight is that it requires an acceptance of it, an agreement with it, and an accountability to it. The call of God requires an acceptance of it. It requires an agreement with it, and it requires an accountability to it for all parties involved, for all parties involved, and acceptance to it. Somebody put it on the screen. An agreement with it so that other people can see it, and an accountability to it. It is critical for you to understand this, right? So it will prevent you or it will promote you uh, walking into sabotage. If you do not accept the call of God, if you don't agree with it, and if you don't become accountable to it, I promise you, you will become a sabotage. I promise you. Look at what happens to Moses. Look at how it all, almost unfolds. In verse number 24, it says, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord God met him and was about to kill him. Now, here we go. We've been preaching good. And God is using Moses. God is speaking to him. God is building him up. God is telling him who he is. God is launching him forward. He finally goes forward and the angel of the Lord meets him on the road to kill him. This is a major problem in the text. Where does it come from? I want to suggest to you that Moses is getting ready to sabotage. The big question is why? Why? Why is God so against him? Why does scripture say that when the angel of the Lord shows up in Psalm 34 and 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around about them that fear him and delivereth them? Why does he say in Daniel chapter 6, 22, that my God has set his angel and has shut the mouths of the lions that they have not hurt me? Why does the psalmist in Psalm 91 say, because thou has made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high my habitation, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all of thy ways. When I look at the angel of the Lord showing up, a great portion of it is that they come to encourage. They come to build up, right? They come to move in my life, but they also come to destroy. So when the angel comes to destroy Moses, we have to ask ourselves, what is the problem? What's happening to Moses, right? And what's happening to Moses is in verse number 25. The Bible says, but Zipporah, she takes a flint knife and she cuts off her son's 
foreskin, that circumcision. And she touches Moses' feet or she touches his, his feet with it. And she says, surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. Now, this is the major moment in his life where the sabotage becomes real. Because what becomes apparent and obvious to us is that Moses has tried to step out in what God has called him to. And Moses has, has neglected to do something that is very critical. Moses has neglected to accept a portion of God's law for his life. Moses has neglected to agree with the right way to step into God's call. Moses has forgotten to make himself accountable to God's law. In all of this, Moses' actions are getting ready to lead to a sabotage because he's getting ready to be destroyed because he has already shown that he is afraid. He's already shown that he is fearful, right? He's already shown that he is confused about what's in his hand. He's already shown that although he's stepping out, he's less than perfect. And the reason why I want to drive that nail in the coffin for you is that here is a man that is being used by God. Here is a man that's living for God. But if we really do justice to the text, here is the man that still has issues in his heart and his issues become full circle. Right. Right. Not not when he asked Jerry, can I come see my family? Oh, no, not then. When he finally steps out and when he gets on the path of God's call, when he becomes in a when he gets to a vulnerable spot at the lodge, when he gets so far into the call. Right. It shows up. It begins to tell on him. How many of us have found ourselves in that place? This is where the sabotage comes on your job. This is where the sabotage comes in your relationships. It's easy to, to like someone. It's easy to get involved with someone. It's easy to have some intimacy with someone. It's easy to have sexual intercourse with someone. But once you have it and the real work begins, now the vulnerability shows up. It's easy to court someone and get married. But after the honeymoon is over, that five-year mark and the real work really begins, now we see where sabotage starts to make its way. Now we see all of the other stuff that start to come up. It's easy to lie on a resume or it's easy to use a resume and get on a job, right? But once you get in the job and once you get to the right project, now the weaknesses begin to show up. And here is a man who's gotten into the word of God and steps in the word of God. He has apprehensions because he's human and I get that, but he neglects to obey God's word and he neglects to step into the fullness of what God has for him. He neglects to align himself with the way God says to do it. He attempts to do it his way. And I want to suggest to you why he really does this. And this is something you got to really listen to. I want to suggest that his relationship with his wife, Zipporah, his relationship with a Midianite, he's an Israelite who knows the covenant. It's been 400 years since God has moved, but, but Israel knows the covenant of Abraham. And, and, and when Moses realizes that he is the one, and he always knows that he's an Israelite, so he knows, he learns, he understands his history and his culture. So he knows what circumcision is all about. I want to suggest to you that the fact that his wife here takes the flint and cuts the foreskin of the sun has a lot to do with with why Moses is apprehensive about circumcising his son. He takes both of them, but he forgets to circumcise one. And his wife says, you are a bridegroom of blood unto me, suggested in the original language that she was not for circumcision in the beginning. And so when God brings the angel to them and is about to deal with the son, I want to suggest to you that God is dealing with Moses because his apprehension of circumcised his son. I want to suggest to you theologians that this is why this scripture sits in between the prophecy that God gave to, to Pharaoh about the firstborn son and why he said uh, that Israel is my 
firstborn son. It's a bit theological, but just hear what I'm saying right quick. God gives a prophecy to Pharaoh that talks about the firstborn son. And so he tells it through Moses so that Moses can understand and be reminded of the law. Moses steps out on the word without fulfilling the firstborn law or the circumcision law. Now Moses and his wife get into a situation where the angel shows up and the original Hebrew language says his and not Moses. That's another lesson but I want to suggest to you that it really points to the children now being in danger because the children are not a part of the covenant. So you cannot step all the way into it if you are not a part of it. And so the same judgment now that was for Pharaoh is about to fall on Moses' household because he's had a lack of understanding. And he has a lack of understanding, y'all, I want to suppose, because he's married to a Midianite. And however God has given him a provision of protection in the wilderness, he's given him a family. He's allowed him to have 40 years on the back out of the wilderness, don't you ever think that God meant for Moses to disobey his word? Don't you ever think that God meant for Moses to, to put down the law of God? God is serious about his word. He's serious about his blessing, but he's serious about his word. He's serious about the way that he unfolds his word in your life. It must be according to his word, according to what is written. I told you before, God does not move just by your emotions. I told you before, God just, just doesn't move by, by your feelings. God moves according to his word. So if this thing is going to work in your life, it's got to work by the word. Or if you don't know the word of God, you had a great disadvantage. If you won't take the time to read it and to understand it, you will sabotage every single time. Because when opposition comes, right? When fear comes, when your own emotions raise up, when your own weaknesses, your insecurities, right? When your own procrastination, when, when your own self-efficacy, when all of those things show up, you don't know the word, you are going to sabotage and stop. You're going to, uh, uh, you're going to uh, slow down. You're going to hinder. You're going to uh, back up everything that God wants to do in your life. And you could already be on the path. You could already be on the path. Don't you ever think that because you start the path that you're going to finish the past, path being disobedient. Oh, the grace of God. Somebody say the grace of God. The grace of God is new. The tender mercies of God, they are new every morning. But don't you ever think that God doesn't require holiness. He says, be holy for I am holy. Don't you ever think that God does not require your obedience. Don't you ever think that when God gives you a word that you don't have to get in that word and study some more and dig deeper and get, get the presence of God way down on the inside of you. When God gives you a word, you must flush out the rest of it. When he gives you a piece of the puzzle, you must consecrate for the rest of the puzzle. When he speaks one word into your heart, you must dig deep in the word for the entire sentence. God gives you a word. You got to flesh out the sentence. Are you understanding what I'm tell, trying to tell you? You have the responsibility and the accountability to be holy for he is already holy. Oh, he's a man destined for greatness, but he's about to mess it up because he compromises. He sabotages this thing. He allows his wife to convince him not to circumcise their son. And he tries to step out in God's will. And God says, I got to deal with you because if I don't deal with you now, if I don't put this test in your face now, when you finally get to Egypt and when the death angel that you don't know, when it finally shows up, you are going to be caught up and destroyed like everybody else. Let me preach to the love that God has for you. If you don't get yourself together right now in this season, when you finally step into it for real, you might be destroyed because the devil will come in new levels for your life. You've heard it preach, new levels, new devils. The devil is not afraid of you. He will come for you. He will raise up a standard against you. He will try to destroy you. He will attack your finances. He will attack your body. He will attack everything thing that he attacked in Job. He will attack your mental faculties. He will attack everything that he can get 
his hand on to because he wants to destroy you. And he watches carefully to see if you're walking in the word. He's always looking to see who he can devour, who he can destroy, who he can stop. If he can stop you, he can stop generations. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you tonight? If he can stop you, he can destroy your entire family, your entire bloodline. If he can destroy you, mama, he can destroy your children. Daddy, if he can destroy you, he can destroy your sons. The enemy is not afraid to come after you, so you have to accept God's will. You've got to agree with God's will, and you've got to make yourself accountable to God's will so that God's will can be done in your life. The world is counting on you. The next generation is counting on you. Your children, they are counting on you, right? The people in your neighborhood, they are counting on you. Your city is counting on you. There's people's prosperity connected to you. There are jobs connected to the business that God has called you. There are people connected to the way that you worship. There are people connected to the way that you can articulate the word of God. There are people who are connected to the way that you can serve. Nobody can serve like you. Nobody can love like you. Can you prophesy? Can you build yourself up for a minute? Can you just put it on the screen and say nobody? Nobody can serve like you. Nobody can love like you. Come on, give me some affirmations. Nobody can lead like you. Nobody can cover and protect like you. Nobody can speak into a situation like you. Nobody, sister, can pray like you. When you pray, God stands up. God don't need you, but God has called you to pray. So when you begin to pray, when you begin to speak the word of God, God begins to move because he's found someone that's ready to pray. He had someone that will pray according to his word and not pray according to his flesh. He's found someone that knows how to separate themselves from all of the fluff, all of the foolishness, all of the worries of the day that they can concentrate, that they can lock in and they can get in his word. And God loves to answer his word. He loves to move out on his word. He's found someone that can sow a seed, that can sow it the right way, that can believe God for a mountain moving experience, that can believe God for a breakthrough, that can believe God for a blessing. God's found someone and that person is you. That's you, that's you. You cannot sabotage. You cannot let something knock you off. You cannot let someone stop you from obeying God. I need you to repeat it after me. I am what God says I am. I am not a sabotage. I am what God says I am. I am not going to stay in this place any longer. I'm not going to stay in this season of, 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 of depression any longer. I'm not going to stay in this moment of feet any longer. I'm not going to talk myself out of this blessing. I'm not going to talk myself out of the call that God has for me. I'm not going to lower myself. I'm going to believe God. I'm going to believe what he's put in my life because he has already guaranteed my success from the beginning. Where my preachers at that says he calls, he speaks to the end, right? From what? The beginning. It's already been written. It's already been decided. It's already been, been decreed in the mind of God. The missing element is you. It's you. It's what you say. It's what you see. It's what you step into. It's what you trust God to do. It's what you believe him for. If you believe it, say, I'm launching, right? Better yet, say, let's go. Come on, let's put our number one affirmation. Say, let's go. If you believe it, say, let's go. If you're the one, say, let's go, right? If you hear God talking to you right now, say, let's go. God, I hear you. I, I was about to sabotage. I was about to mess this relationship up. I was about to step in the wrong relationship. I was about to let this business go. I was about to try something that God never called me to try. Let, let's, let's go. Let's do it God's way. Let's try it God's way. Let's, let's hear what God is telling us to do. Let's try that. Hold. Hold. Let's try that. Right? So I want you to I want you to say this to yourself. You don't have to put this, you don't have to put this on the screen because it's a lot. I want you to say it to yourself as we wrap up. I am worthy of the job. I belong at the table. This relationship is for me. He has called me to this moment. Right? I am fully equipped for my assignment. Just say that. And then put your own affirmation on it. Put your own spiritual declaration on this. I am what God says I am. Whew. Whew. Yeah. No longer will I sabotage 
the right relationships. I will get away from the wrong relationships, but I will not sabotage the right relationships. No longer will I sabotage the right career. I will move and get away from the wrong careers and the wrong opportunities, and I will find myself in the right ones. No longer will I will I smother or put down my call. I, I will step into my call. I will receive it. I will accept my calling. I will agree with what God says I am. And I will become accountable to what God says I am. I'm going to say it one last time. One last time. I will accept what God says I am. I will be in agreement with what God says I am. And I will become accountable to what God says my, I am. My heart will acknowledge his will. My confession will confirm my belief. And my actions will validate my confession. Let me pray for you tonight. Father, I thank you for an incredible word. God, that has hit both ways. Thank you for your love, Father God, and for your mercy, Lord God. God, that you love us so much that you would speak into the very depths of our heart, God, that you have something bigger and greater for us. So God, right now we come before you, Father God. And Lord, we just repent, Father God, of disbelief. We repent of fear, Lord God. And we repent most of all tonight of sabotaging what you have called us to do. Now, God, I ask you in Jesus' name to restore, God, what we have messed up, God. Restore, God, what we have been slow to step out into, Father God. Restore, Father God, what we have invested in the wrong way, God. Restore to us what you have for us, Lord God. And allow us to serve you, God. Allow us to speak on your behalf, Lord God. Allow us to be a light in a dark place, Father God. Allow us to prosper, God, that we might be a blessing to someone else. God, and we just give you all of the glory. We give you the honor, Lord God, and we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say amen and amen. Ooh. Ooh, I'm, on, I'm on 100 right now. So let me do this. Let me just take the moment and because there may be someone on here who doesn't know the Christ. There may be someone on here who's never made the Lord or uh, their personal Lord and Savior. So I just want to speak to you real quickly. If you're here and if you're watching or maybe you're watching the replay, I want to offer a sincere relationship to Christ. All of this that I'm that I'm talking about in Moses' story, all, all of it really relates to the fact that he was he was a child of God. He was called to a great thing. But Moses, let us not uh, forget that Moses had a sincere relationship uh, with the Lord. And so so we want to offer you that relationship because it's very critical for you to be in the right covenant with God. So the circumcision we, we talked around represents the heart that is now circumcised, the heart that, that, that is made alive again unto God, the heart that is regenerated unto God. And so I want to offer him to you. How, how do you do that, Juan? Well, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's what circumcision is in the Bible, in the New Testament. It is the belief in your heart and the confession that comes out of your mouth, that you verbally tell God, God, I hear you, I receive Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. So all I want to do is lead you in a prayer or just a confession. If you just repeat after me, and those of us who are born again already, we, we, we repeat it together uh, for the sake of you, so, so that we can celebrate and be in agreement with you. All you have to say is, Father God, I realize that I was born separated from you. That means I was a sinner. I am a sinner. But tonight, I've heard that my heart must be changed. It must be circumcised. So tonight, Lord, I cut off my old flesh and I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I truly believe, God, that he died for my sins. And I truly believe that you raised him from the dead and seated him right next to you in heaven. So tonight, God, I confess him as my Lord and Savior. And I receive a new life in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, that I am saved. I am a child of God. Now teach me how to walk, Father God, so that I may please you in everything that I do. In Jesus' name, amen.